There's no doubt that network automation is a hot topic these days. I've written about it quite extensively on Forbes. Automation provides the opportunity for agility and the reduction of OPEX, but most solutions are not complete today. So that sets some context for the conversation that I'm gonna be having with Nokia. I'd like to welcome Bruce Wallace. He's Senior Director of Product Management, Data Center Switching and Routing. Welcome. All right, thanks, Will. It's uh, very, very nice to be here. I'm glad to have the conversation today. Yeah, so Bruce, before we get started, can you share a little bit about your background and what you have responsibility for at Nokia? Yeah, for sure. So as uh, some of the audience will likely pick up, I'm uh, I'm in the US right now, but my accent is from New Zealand. So I uh, I started in networking supporting service providers back in uh, back in New Zealand and uh, have been in the US since about 2014. I was lucky enough, I would say right place, right time to uh, to be sitting in uh, in Mountain View right when we were, were thinking about kicking off this data center thing. So I've been uh, with the, the program right, right back since its inception in 20, uh, 2018. And uh, at the moment, I lead product management for uh, a couple of the kind of key components that make up our data center uh, fabric solution, which is the uh, the operating system, SR Linux, and the uh, the controller, the, uh, the fabric services system, which uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about today. We're going to talk about the Nokia data center fabric solution. You know, and Bruce, from my perspective, uh, there are a lot of networking infrastructure providers that are focused on just the network operating system alone. But what makes Nokia's approach different? Yeah, I think um, I like to this this term of uh, consumption or consumability on a on a spectrum, which is, you know, we built the solution to target. Uh, kind of the hyperscalers of the world, people that are very DIY, people that will typically write their own controller. And that means we need a lot of standard interfaces. We need a lot of standardization around the controller to network operating system interface. Yeah. And uh, a big theme on extensibility and trying to promote extensibility throughout uh, throughout the operating system. And we also have to cater for kind of your enterprise that doesn't want to get in the weeds, just wants the thing to work. They want to turn it on and have everything happen like magic. Um, mm -hmm. So catering for these two different sides of the of the world mean, as you kind of allude to, you need a kind of a multi-layered solution. So the operating system definitely is is not enough. You need a controller. You need probably even the surrounding hardware because there's a bunch of bunch of integration points there. And I think. Uh, our solution is a, is a little unique in that we kind of have that full portfolio and that we have a, a controller, we have some, uh, you know, a, a software stack that runs on some hardware. And all of these are very, very tightly integrated, but also as decoupled as can possibly be. So all these use standard interfaces, which means that you can kind of take one component and leave it. Um, but of course, we highlight a lot of the uh, the power of our operating system and things like streaming telemetry to enable our controller to make uh, to make better decisions around what is happening in the network. Um, but we don't put that inside a kind of a black box where, you know, you, you don't know how it works and you just consume things through the controller. So yeah. I think that's what makes our solution a little unique. You know, we developed this in a time where technology had come far enough that things like uh, on-chain telemetry were kind of uh, in model-driven management were all things we were trying to do as an industry. But most vendors were going through a transition of how do I actually get there? How do I add this functionality? We kind of started, luckily enough, where most of this kind of... Uh, already was established as the means to do this. So we got to kind of build a best of breed solution that uh, that that bring this all together. Well, I'm wondering too, I mean, is there any is there any leverage from what you've done on the service provider side of the business as well? Because those are very, very high performing networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So part of uh, kind of the, the first, I would say almost like 18 months of the project was spent figuring out exactly that. You know, we have... Uh, uh, an operating system in our SROS that drives some of the largest networks in the world, some of the highest highest scale of networks in the world. How do we bring that into kind of a new form of packaging where we don't break our ties back to kind of our, our crown jewel, which are those routing stacks? So okay. for sure, it has helped us kind of accelerate uh, development of features in that, you know, in SR Linux, the operating system, it's the exact same routing stack that runs in our kind of our WAN product that deals with all this craziness. So there's a, a huge quality angle in that our customers are able to benefit from the hundreds of thousands of hours of QA that have gone into that routing stack. But also it lets us turn up features at an insanely rapid rate. You know, we we launched uh, SR Linux back in 2019. And since then, we have uh, every control plane protocol under the sun with a very, very rich feature set. Uh, among them, we have segment routing. 
We have uh, LDP, of course, we have all the EVP and VXLAN stuff that goes on in the data center. We kind of have this full full suite of uh, applications that we've been able to turn up at, a, at an insanely rapid rate in, in comparison to our competitors, yeah. which, yeah, I think definitely has helped a lot. You know, when I kind of look back, and I don't want to bemoan the pandemic because we just want to put that in the rearview mirror, but mm -hmm. uh, but it's no, there's no question that automation played a key role with, um, you know, people having to work remotely, including IT professionals as well. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, a lot of solutions fall short; they're not complete. But I'm wondering, as you sort of look forward, how do you envision network automation, you know, evolving over the next couple of years? Yeah, for sure. So I think there's there's two kind of common trends going on. I think one is, you know, this term intent-based networking. It's not necessarily a, a new term, but I think we're still on the cusp of it rolling out and actually being consumed. And, you know, there's no there's no real magic here, right? When we talk about intent-based networking, all we're talking about is some kind of closed loop automation where you're setting something and you're going to validate that it stays set. What I think the the trend is, is that we're seeing a lot of abstraction on top of that intent. So we're trying to kind of formulate the input into the system as being as close to the actual business logic, what you're actually trying to do as, as possible, because at the end of the day, there's a human interacting with that interface. And kind of the magic happens where we translate that input into some underlying configuration and distribute it and then monitor it using our, our streaming telemetry. So yeah. I think that trend will continue, will, will continue to grow. I think the other trend um, is around more and more of what happens after the network has been deployed. So, you know, after you've powered up the boxes and after you've pushed initial configuration, more of those interactions being driven by kind of the surrounding ecosystem. So I think a big part of that is, you know, our networks, especially in the data center, are, are more often than not uh, supporting some kind of compute stack, whether it be Kubernetes or, or, or OpenStack, if you still have that around, or maybe yeah. some VMware. Um, and a lot of the change going into the network is being driven by those surrounding compute stacks. And I need to attach a VLAN here, or I'm bringing up a new rack of compute, uh, com a new compute cluster. So I need to stitch all the storage and infra services and things like that. So I think, uh, kind of this machine to machine interaction where, you know, the interface to the network is no longer necessarily through kind of the fabric controller or the network controller. You're actually consuming the network as part of the workloads that you're provisioning around uh, around the network on those surrounding compute stacks. So, right. those two trends definitely, I think, uh, are, are almost at the point they're hitting kind of uh, you know exponential growth, if you want to call it that. The last I will say is uh, there's this whole concept of kind of self-healing, self-driving networks. Um, the the whole idea here being that. As a network controller, there's a degree of visibility you have that a degree of correlation that you can make um, that a human necessarily can't make in the same degree of time. So we uh, we want to get into a state where we can really kind of put our networks into autopilot. And this can be simple things like maybe you're seeing packet loss on one of your spines in the data center and the system's smart enough to know that, okay, there's three other spines there and you have redundancy and no links are down. So maybe I'm just going to drain traffic from that spine and allow someone to come in and, and debug it at a later date. Mm -hmm. Things like that, like simple optimizations that just mitigate traffic loss and uh, you know, kind of flag for a user to come in later. I think we're going to see a lot more of that going forward. I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to uh, double clicking into, I think, what a lot of network administrators really struggle with. And so, you know, often in today's data center networks, labs are set up to test and validate changes to the network, such as software upgrades, OS upgrades, config changes, this sort of thing. And when it's done improperly, it can really throw things off. So, but, but that whole process seems really archaic to me. Is there a, a way that this process can be automated as well? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So one thing we've been, uh, you know, banging the drum on for quite a while is we've seen kind of how, uh, how fruitful the concept of CICD, the whole idea that you're going to test something in some automated fashion before you roll it out has really helped the application world in terms of just cadence of delivering features, but also the reliability of, of those features and, and bug fixes for that matter. So in networking, it's actually a really challenging problem to crack because it isn't as simple as, you know, spin up a container of an operating system and throw some config at it. And if it accepts it, then that's a good change, right? That could actually right. be a really bad change depending on what you're trying to do. <laughs> right. Um, so there's this whole concept of 
you know, a big portion of what we do in a network or how our network behaves is probably a better way to refer to it is around the state in the network. You know, what links are up, which systems that I'm peering with are, are available, you know, what routes am I receiving from, from my control plane neighbors? So uh, what we've, uh, what we've built in the fabric services system is something we call the digital sandbox. And, you know, at a 50,000 foot view, the whole concept here is that you have a production network. There's a bunch of configuration and state and devices that live there. We want to actually create a twin of that network where you can spin up a copy of that production network yeah. and we can actually inject the state that's happening in production. So, you know, if a link is down in the production network, the link is going to be down in the sandbox. And this is kind of then your, your CI CD pipeline, if you will. So you can imagine you're rolling out a routing policy change or doing an upgrade of some element in the network. First thing you do is a sandbox gets spun up. You run the change through there first. There's a bunch of automated testing, very similar to what you would see in CI for some of these uh, application kind of projects. Sure. And only if you pass CI, if all that testing is, is complete, do you roll out into production. So I think there's a ton of different initiatives going on in this space. Uh, we actually have a couple of them on the Nokia side. One is Container Lab, which is all around just, you know, providing container topologies with, uh, uh, and that has more of like a multi-vendor spin, that project's open source. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have our digital sandbox, which is leveraging all of the streaming telemetry we've baked into SR Linux and is really putting that to to great use and having that streaming telemetry be re-injected into, into the sandbox. So the theme here is we're going to be making more changes, but those changes are going to be more atom automated, not just from an input perspective, but also a testing perspective to, to your point right. um, before they roll into production. And this, of course, lends itself to reliability. And if you trust that reliability, then it, it also accelerates the cadence of adopting change in our in our fabrics. Bruce, it's been a great conversation, but as we as we sort of wrap things up, I'd love if you could share a few tips or tricks with um, mm -hmm. um, enterprises that are just beginning to embark on a on a uh, network automation journey. Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, the first thing I'll say, and it's probably a little cliche, is start small, start simple. I mean, there are a ton of things we as humans do as operators uh, managing networks. And a big part of that is understanding the way you use the network, the interactions you have with it, and even just leveraging some of the, the common tooling that's out there. You know, things like Ansible, Puppet, Chef, uh, Terraform, even some of the kind of the movements around automating this using Kubernetes controllers. Uh, that's probably a little bit more on the extreme side, but starting simple, finding a use case that, uh, you know, is genuinely going to impact your day-to-day -day life. Because um, I think it's about starting a trend that this stuff matters, that it really eases the adoption of change in the network and helps uh, it helps produce some re reproducibility around the change, right? So it's really a case of if there's a human interacting with the network, write a sequence of steps and, you know, put them into a program of some sorts that will enact that change for you. And start simple. I mean, really, really start simple. Leverage things like uh, Container Lab, spin up topologies and just inject configuration into them. Kind of you can build your own CI pipelines doing that. And honestly, you get a a huge uplift in the reliability of the change, even just from that, right? Is uh, We in, uh, in Nokia, we actually make our SR Linux container image uh, public. So it's not sitting behind a registration wall. It's not sitting behind a paywall. Um, you can you can do a Docker pull right now from the GitHub container registry and pull it down. So, you know, spin those kinds of things up and kind of inject your configuration. Try to figure out the steps of, you know, what a CI CD style automation looks like and start with something super, super simple. So you can immediately see kind of the tangible gain of of doing this and, and what it really means for for your day to day uh, when operating a network. Bruce, it's been a great conversation. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the uh, for the talk. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the time.